This is episode 42, and this week we're talking about certification. Certification. Start with the definition. The action or process of providing someone or something with an official document attesting to status or level of achievement. <laughs> Proof that something has happened or been done. Okay. It's looked upon as a tennis teaching license. In most countries, the governing body of tennis certifies tennis teaching professionals or coaches. Yeah. In a previous podcast, Miron Mann, Richard Hernandez touched upon the Canadian process of yeah. reaching various levels of professionalism or competency. Yeah, if you haven't checked out those episodes, please go back and do that. Great stuff. In the U.S., two main certifications in the tennis industry, the USPTA and the PTR. Yeah. United States Professional Tennis Association was founded in 1927. 50 years later, Professional Tennis Registry in 1977. Mm -hmm. Initially, the USPTA was just an organization of tennis players. The PTR was the first organization to have a test to become a member in 1977. Mm -hmm. I know I became a member in 79. Shortly afterwards, the USPTA had a slogan, best by test. So competition was fierce. It's like McDonald's went on <laughs> up on one corner and then Burger King on the next. <laughs> my position was to be a member of both for my students to be a member of both. The motive was first and foremost, job placement. Right. In the 80s, my job was to get other people jobs. Um, later, as we go on, we can talk about the test and the testing experiences. I think most people remember when they were tested. Yeah. 81, I had the privilege of revising general recreation curriculum on a college campus and do a comprehensive curriculum degree plan. We offer the following certifications. This is interesting. CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Yeah. It's no longer required. That's amazing. It used to be every year. Yeah, and most most places I've worked, it, you, you did have to have that certification. Yeah, but I, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so now. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, I've actually seen it administered only twice in my career, and one 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 was a, a death, and the other was a heroic effort to save a life. Wow. NTRP, the National Tennis Rating Program. Mm. I think people are familiar with the 3.5, 4.0 status, so it goes one through seven. Yeah, especially here in the U.S. You had to be certified to be an NT. RP ver verifier, but then shortly after it was changed and now it's self rating. That's proven to be a successful model for adult social and competitive tennis. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really never taken off with juniors. Numerous positives. One, adult tennis leagues. So it's helped the business of tennis. Mm. A negative of the NTRP, it greatly reduced, if not eliminated, veteran versus youth matches. Mm. The USRSA. United States Racket Stringers Association. So this uh, college degree plan, we had seven certifications and this was the most difficult to pass. Mm -hmm. You can masquerade as a tennis teacher, but you can't masquerade as a stringer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we had uh, Vasily Gurinov here for about a month who he's a professional stringer. And, you know, I've been stringing for a long time since I was 13 years old, actually at the Big Braden Tennis College. Steve Campbell taught me how to string. But it was amazing. I just, you know, to watch him work and to do what he did, I was going, man, I've got a lot of bad habits. <laughs> There's, you know, I can tell that that, that certification's got to be. It's know, interesting to, en to enter the tennis teaching profession or the tennis profession. Um, I'd say the easiest way to do it is to be a tennis teacher. But one that really helps is if you can string rackets. Yeah. Compu tennis. We've talked about Bill Jacobson. Yeah. Another great episode to go back. Charting matches a computer, gathering the data, analyzing statistics. Mm -hmm. You could be certified to do that. Uh, the USTA umpire, and that was a long weekend because you would just line by line read the rule book. Whew. And um, actually, Vic Braden, who we need to talk about, one of our eight pillars, before we close out our first year podcast. Yeah. Uh, Vic put videotapes together for the USTA because he had done so much eye research mm -hmm. and what you could and could not see. Yeah. His videotapes, obviously, Vic lightened it up, and those were, uh, they were pretty entertaining. That's why you can't read a newspaper when you run. Yeah. <laughs> I but, think I actually put that video up where it shows that the ball landing on the core is just a three millisecond avoid event. So the, the human eye sees the incoming and the outgoing trajectory. Yeah. I'm always telling kids when they play doubles, when they shift their head to look at their partner, Yeah, their vision is blurred. Yeah. It's not 2020. 
Yeah, the reaction time is reduced. The book Hitting Blind is really good if for you listeners if you want to nerd out on the what the eye does in tennis. Hitting Blind, written in the seventies. Dennis Vanderbilt, one of our other pillars, we still need to talk about as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was the founder of the PTR. He traveled to our campus each year with his wife and staff. For several years, we broke the record for the most PTR uh, tested members, 50, yeah. 50 plus. That's awesome. We had a course called Group Dynamics, and we, we used uh, all the education materials from the PTR. Mm. And then we had test procedures and test prep practice during our, encon- our on-court lab. So the second year, the students would take the use PTA test. It was a ditto as far as breaking the records world record for most people tested. Mm. We had a lecture class that was dedicated just to passing the USPT exam. Mm-hmm. The written test was comprehensive. It was business management, it was pro shop math, it was history, term and organization. Yeah. Currently, to my knowledge, both the PTR and USPT have uh, two other racket sports to their organizations, Padel or um, Paddle. Yeah. Pickleball, pickleball. In the past, neither organization added such racket sports as squash or racquetball. I certainly question why the two organizations would not continue to just be tennis specialists, pure tennis specialists. My well, opinion, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> Should I say it? Go for it. Money. Money, money, money. I question why, uh, okay, my opinion would be that uh, the additions represent a sign of desperation for dollars. Does that sound fair enough? <laughs> On the yeah, pos- I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, uh, pickleball is fun, for sure. I mean, it it is fun, but yeah, for sure, it's a money maker right now. But on the positive side, under and understand where the PTR and use PTA have their members serving facilities, where now they're directors and have to manage pickleball. Yeah, exactly. Sort of, there's other certifications I call them the add-ons in my time that have come and gone. Uh, just to mention a few in, a couple, in recent years, Pat Etchenberry. Mm-hmm. I went to his program twice, the Spanish program. Mm-hmm. Uh, went to it really, I'd say, two and a half times, uh, twice in completion, and another time where the USPTA offered just part of it. Mm. I know you've been through this. I recently went through the UST High Performance. Mm-hmm. Uh, our fifth course is just called Player Development, yeah. and that was an assignment I was issued to pass... Um, the UST high performance class. Yeah, player development assignment. You can check that out on our course, or sorry, on our website. There's always new certifications. Now there's one called Racket Fit. Uh, the USPTA specialty courses. And uh, again, I am not an expert by any means um, with the, the USPTA and PTR, or I should say I'm not really current. We'll get into that. Uh, there is a, a PTR course that's, just for managers only. I think of certifications as feathers in your cap. Mm-hmm. They do help with job, job placement. They should help one with their career as well. I think why the PTR and use PTA are still up and running, I wish there was uh, other reasons, but I think the biggest reason is liability insurance. Mm-hmm. There's many tennis facilities, tennis clubs here in the U.S., that you have to have liability insurance to, right. to be employed. Yeah. And the insurance with both organizations is very, very much the same. Tennis is pretty much like swim at your own risk. Mm-hmm. Very few times is there any legal issues with uh, tennis injuries. Recommendations for the PTR and use PTA. Um, I recommend that people join, be associated, be active. Each organization has approximately 15,000 members. There used to be a directory Yeah, each year. Members were mailed a hard copy. It was like a mini telephone book. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's not the case now. And to my knowledge, you can't get online and just find out who your co-members are or your fellow members and get phone numbers. Uh, Now I understand it's um, purchasing an email blast. Hmm. So it's not as easy to network. My memberships, um, PTR 1979, USPTA 1982, um, I served as a tester for both. Uh, the PTR test. I had attended courses conducted by Dennis Vandermeer. He ran a weekend course that was in front of, it was part of a 10-day university. Dennis Vandermeer's Tennis University. 
Uh, he used to take 36 or be a waiting list. I can remember um, Dennis was my first tester hmm. and he generally didn't serve as the test. Um, with every time he made a mistake, he blew the whistle <laughs> and he blew the whistle off it. <laughs> At the time when you'd pass, you'd be a professional one, professional two was an instructor, professional three was an apprentice. Hmm. The test was a written test, a plain test and a group lesson test. The plain test was just a matter of hitting targets and it wasn't really like go play three sets. It was, you know, can you demonstrate strokes? Can you, can you feed balls? Yeah. Um, the USP test, I remember I was tested by Tony Dawson. I got a P2. Um, it was in Houston. I had to teach one of his students and I had to teach her the backhand. Mm -hmm. um, she was probably in her 35s. 35 to 40 years old and played league tennis. And I said, how do you like your backhand? And she said, I love my backhand. <laughs> so I was marked off for, for proceeding to teach her a loop and to close the rack face, hit a little top spin. Oh my gosh, Smith, what were you doing? And I you know, could see his point <laughs> where, um, I mean, I'd ask the question, she played doubles and, but fair enough, um, you know, he, the, the commentary on the score was I should have taught movement, placement, strategy, but not proceeded with technical input. You were trying to take her to a level that she didn't want to go to. <laughs> the tester didn't want me to teach technique because she loved her back end. Exactly. And also to a small setting, other like unlike our campus where we would have 50 plus taking the test eventually, there was just a handful of us taking the test. Hmm. It is, sometimes it's very awkward if you're, you're gonna give a lesson to the tester student. Uh, it's actually a few months later, I was assisting Vic Braden in Dallas yeah. and uh, Tony drove us to, I think it was Las Colinas. And I remember, uh, saying, yeah, Tony, I rem remember me. I was one of your, <laughs> one of your uh, students, yeah. you tested me. Yeah. And I remember Vic saying, the test, let's talk about the test. <laughs> yeah, how'd you do? <laughs> With, uh, um, I was upgraded by George Basho. George Basho, a former school teacher, Mm. The late George Bay show, he was so dedicated to the USPTA. Yeah. Um, they had the same levels, one, two, three, but the third one was professional instructor associate. Vic had his own certification. It was the USTA. It was the United States Tennis Academy. That's yeah, amazing. At one time, he ran that program twice a year. Then he relinquished the name. The USTA was the USLTA. United States Lawn Tennis Association. And yeah. less and less tennis was on grass. He relinquished the name for free. For free. Nice I guy, mean, Vic. Come on, USDA, if you're listening. You should, I don't know. Yeah, we could step up and say what they should do with Vic Braden's uh, legacy and the contributions he made to tennis. We'll, we'll get into that. Yeah. With, um, I attended Vic's uh, USTA as a staff, first as a student, I went twice in one year the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, then I was a staff member, I would go twice, but then I was a guest. I went to a total of 10 times. Up in our library, we actually have the USTA, the United States Tennis Academy, um, on audio tape. And he, yeah. had a, he had a test at the end of it. It was 200 questions. Remember the first time I got a 188, the next time I got a 197. I can yeah. tell our listeners what I got wrong. Mm -hmm. um, do you run through or stop on half volleys? And I said, stop. You and the other one was a film. Idiot. The other one was a <laughs> film loop um, where you had to watch um, the baseball pitcher. I think it was Don Drysdale. Mm. Vic thought it would be very easy to teach him how to serve, but he threw sidearm. Mm. But he did get around to playing tennis and he had a serve that was a scissors. And I just put it down as down together, up together. <laughs> and the other one, Vic had very few uh, questions that didn't pertain to tennis teaching, but one was, is 40 all deuce, mm. true or false? And it is false. 40 all is 40 all. 40 all, 40 yeah. all is not deuce. And a scissors is when your tossing arm is up and your racket arm is down. Yeah, and they come in all sizes with a tennis player. <laughs> yeah. Some are slight. Most teaching, most touring pros have a slight. A little bit of scissors. Scissors. With yeah. a, ideally, that you want to have the the left arm going up, if you're a righty, ahead of the right, what we call reverse scissors is what a lot of beginners have that have been taught to scratch their back first. Yeah. 
USPTA, they responded to the PTR by having the most thorough, comprehensive test. It was a grip test, stroke analysis, skills test, written test. It was a private lesson, and there was a group lesson. Now, then the written test was long. Yeah, I think that's changed quite a bit, because I remember when I took it, I took it in 97 or 98, and it was like you had to write an essay, like how to, how to hit a forehand ground stroke. I mean, there was a lot of written stuff. It used to have a tournament on it where you had to know where to place your buys, where to play your, place your seeds. Yeah. And I know we're so much in the lane of just teaching and coaching tennis. Uh, so by no means am I an expert on either organization. And I know that there's many, um, many departments, many components of the industry that the organizations uh, touch upon. But the main ones are obviously the USPTA and PTR. Yeah. Um, like I think, for example, it's great for uh, career-minded tennis teachers to become an umpire, even if you never become an umpire. Yeah, I think one of our students at Tennis Tech, uh, Steve Ulrich, he yeah he was in the chair all these big time matches. Yeah, um, he just fell in love with uh, being an umpire. Yeah, it's cool because I remember, you know, before I knew you, when I was just a teenager. Westwood, Los Angeles. I remember going up, you know, the LA Open was there. And you see these guys on TV and you kind of, you know, you get to know the umpires because there wasn't that many. But I remember waiting in line at a subway there in the village. And I see Steve Ulrich there, you know, I'm going like, there's Steve Ulrich, like, you know, the umpire. And then years later, I find out that he went to tennis tech. It's pretty cool. Steve's my age. He, last, last time I saw him, he was uh, not in the chair because of his eyesight, but he was um, helping set up Hawkeye and, and that. Yeah. So still making his living through it. Yeah. The USPTA, we'd have 15 testers. That was the highest 15 testers from around the country. Mm-hmm. And then afterwards we have the evaluation feedback session and Mark Twain, every time you meet someone, you meet your master. Every time you meet someone, you meet someone who knows something that you don't, mm-hmm. but it was different. The USPTA was different. It was, uh, I think that sometimes people would refer to Dennis as the dictator with the PTR. He was the one man show. And of course, no one's ever really a one man show, especially as that organization grew and grew. Mm-hmm. And then, but just, you know, the factory workers mentality, you know, the person complaining that USPTA was referred to as a, a good old boy network, mm-hmm. but the PTR had a system and there was no system with the USTA. Yeah. Um, the PTR had more. Or USPTA, right? USPTA had no system. Yeah. PTR did. Uh, USTA there, doesn't really either. <laughs> there was um, there was more technical information technical information with the PTR, but because of our um, academic approach, and especially with with Braden, our students had more technical information than the testers. Now, definitely, you could learn from the testers, and our students would go out and struggle. Okay, maybe some smoothness and transitioning from one part of the lesson to the next and yeah. organizing the group and make sure you call their names eight times. Being personable and all that, yeah. having a collared shirt. Yeah. But the um I remember having uh a couple of assistants we'd go in the room and they would be taking notes and we'd just and I would say, No one's gonna make any facial expressions, no one's gonna laugh. <laughs> Actually when the coaches would do the stroke analysis, they would say, Well, here's my Here's my normal backhand. Here's an efficient backhand, <laughs> and then they'd hit. Then they'd make a flaw, a little hitch or something. Yeah, uh, might change the grip a little bit or take the racket low. And our students really struggled because they were both were flawed. You know, they're they're <laughs> yeah. you know they're normal yeah. stroke. That, I remember taking. You know, we took the test. Maybe we'll talk about this more. But that's the guy who goes. Here's my normal forehand. You know, <laughs> and then it was change one. And you have no forehand. And then I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Where do I start? <laughs> continue, Ned. Um, you, know, you really can't go wrong with continue, Ned. Every college campus has a continue, Ned department. It's amazing what you can do through that department. Mm. Um, we have educational points, both the PTR and the USPTA. Uh, I don't know what the requirements are. Uh, I should, but you ha- you have to acquire so many points per year. Yeah, for the USPTA. For every three years. Yeah, it's every three years, it's, I believe, six points. So it's get your six. I don't the, know about the PTR. And that's not very challenging. With our online courses, the USPTA, for grade base, you get 
0.75. For the PTR, you get 1.5. Home practice, you get 0.5 with the use PTA. PTR, 0.75. Building blocks, use PTA, 0.5. PTR, 1.5. Yeah. Tennis intelligence applied, use PTA, you get 10 points. PTR, you get 25 points. Player development, the use PTA is uh, to be determined. The PTR is 3.75. The PTR yeah. system is basically the length of the course. So our great base yeah. course is an hour and a half. They give us 1.5. Mm-hmm. And you just go right down. The practice course is shorter. Building blocks, 1.5. Tennis intelligence applied 25 hours. Player development, 3.75. With a great base, each course we offer um, an exam. So we actually have a certificate of completion. Yeah. So we are in the certification Mm -hmm. business, even though we don't (laughs) charge any fees. Yeah. Um, Some some tennis certificates are, you pass by attendance only. Some you pass by assignment. Some you pass by test. Okay, my status, I've always paid my dues, never missed a year. Most of my students that were members of both are now only a member of one or not a member of all. Mm. Again, insurance. Um, I have not been proactive really with either organization. I was, uh, especially in the 80s, and I was very close to the PTR in the 80s because I mentioned we, they not only Dennis Vandermeer, but they had um, Jim Lair, they had Jim Verdick. Yeah. In my notes, I have down Bill McKenzie with Tennis Business and Greg Prezzuto with Early Child Development. With, um, I think it's a duty to support both organizations and be a member of both. Hmm. Um I think the real value is being an active member though. Um, we'll come back to that. Yeah. Um, it's not as if we're saying, okay, here's our opinion on either the PTR or the use PTA. I know the testing formats have changed. I believe the PTR has five levels now. Yeah. I think I could guess um, four of them under tens, adults, juniors, and then tournament juniors. If there are five, I'm not sure the last category. Um, I, I, again, not to be cynical or critical, I don't really know why there's five levels. Again, maybe that's a money-making. Yeah, I think it's really just an, it would be like an area of expertise or an area of concentration. Yeah. I, like I'm I'll, a 10 and under expert, Steve. You know, that kind of thing. I think you are correct. To scale it down, though, a forehand's a forehand. Yeah. And I think you have to be able to scale, scale the task down. Um Maybe it is just a, not just a way to increase, increase revenue, but also to increase competency. The PTR under Dennis um, was excellent for entry-level teaching pros. Again, there was a system. What's a system? There's an organized plan. Yeah. Um, with Scott Schultz um, in 1981, so I had a chance to revise this curriculum, Tyler Junior College, Tyler, Texas. Scott Schultz and... Big Rapids? No, Little Rapids. Grand Rapids. Yeah. No, there's Grand Rapids and Big Rapids. So Big Rapids, it's not a big place where Fair State is. Yeah. So he, he followed a few years later, and I remember meeting with him about what we put together, and then there's uh, someone who's high up on the um, on the list of uh, leaders within the USTA, Craig Jones, who I know you know. I don't really know him that well. I did meet him one time. I've listened to him speak Craig jo- three, Craig Jones? three times. Yeah. And he told me I was invited to the USTA. You know, they brought junior coaches in during the US Open for three summers. And, and uh, he had said that Scott Schultz had brought up the great base within USTA meetings. And Greg said, they'll never use the word system. They'll run away from it. Yeah. Uh, but again, a system is just an organized plan. Uh, Dennis's method of progression certainly was a positive. Just Dennis's pre- his, uh, presentation was worth a ticket of admissions. What, yeah. a, what a showman. Let me just say quickly, too, I think you know, the other word you have here, system, but also pathway. You know, and that's what we tell people, that, that the great base is, that, you know, yeah, it's a system of systems, but it's really a pathway to get you from A to B. Yeah, certainly a curriculum. Or A to Z. When I think of tennis teachers... And how unregulated our profession is, I think, of pilots. It's interesting how pilots talk about how many hours of flights they have logged. Mm. Um, understand the number of regulations compared to tennis. It's 
<laughs> level of responsibility. I'm flying an airplane with 400 passengers. Yeah, you better get your systems protecting Correct. the lives of the, the passengers. I was once in, in Denver. I was speaking to tennis parents. It was a training session, and I was talking about the difference between being a pilot. Not that I know anything about that, but and then how again how easy it is to be a teaching pro. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, uh, gentleman came up and the people who were hosting the event encouraged me to go and made the arrangements. So it was with Continental Airlines. It was a pretty expensive toy. It was a simulator. Hmm. And he made me feel like I was flying a <laughs> 747 over a Golden Gate Bridge in a snowstorm at night. <laughs> but the, the point being is you need to be tested you know, there's no simulator for someone. Can you teach the forehand? And what happened to those poor individuals that you were flying over the Golden Gate Bridge? We had no passengers. Some... The simulator. Oh, okay. It was just the two of us. But I mean, there's no pretends. Passengers. No, 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 <laughs> no screaming in the background. <laughs> what happened though? Did you? Did oh, well, he 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 just made me feel like I was pushing the right buttons, but he was doing the whole thing. Oh, okay. Just a gentleman. But tennis is so unregulated. The price may have gone up. I say to be certified tennis pro in America. You need two hundred dollars in two days, so maybe I'm sure now it's uh, you know six hundred dollars in two days, but it's yeah, it's not very expensive. In the U.S., less than half the tennis teachers, and I'm sure that's gone down. I don't, I'm not being doom and gloom, but um, I think now a lot of young people just think they can push buttons on the internet and they don't have to be certified. Mm -hmm. But less than half the teaching pros um, are certified. Doctors, I tease doctors. I tell. The children, I uh, said, yeah, you know, it's much more difficult to be a teaching pro than, than to be a doctor. For a doctor, you know, you just go to Walmart, Kmart, one of those big stores and buy a little certificate. But yeah, I like to ask doctors, when did you get your first real paycheck? Yeah. And generally they say age 35, 34. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, certification, you can become an instant tennis pro. I think it's unfortunate when we would travel and go to these conferences and I've been to so many, not just PTR and use PTA, but typically really good players are not in attendance. They can, they can skip all that. Like most college coaches, yeah. especially in the current times, they're not members of the PTR and use PTA. Yeah, that's interesting. With, but I, I appreciate and respect those who become members. Um, you really could be proactive and take advantage of networking among your fellow members. Dennis Vandermeer, and I think this is really a theme of this podcast. Certification is not education. Yeah. Years afterwards. So I went, worked with Dennis for 10 years on a regular basis um, with training, testing more PTR members, but a tornado touchdown for a couple of days in Atlanta, it, it, the tornado touched down, but then for a couple of days afterwards, there was no teaching because the constant rain. The Tennis Club of the South was hit badly. And all, all sorts of tennis people showed up at the Tennis Club of the South and the people that were hosting the event that I was running. You were teaching with brought tennis, me. right? No, no, it wasn't teaching. Oh. We were teaching, oh, okay. Atlanta's a big place. We were in two different sites. Two different sites, okay. Didn't even know we were both in Atlanta. Yeah. And so we both show up. And we were there the entire day, just picking up branches, picking up debris, mm. had a chance to just sit around and talk. And, you know, that's where he told me, he said, Steve, you're right. You know, certification is not education. Mm. Um, with, the, you know, the efforts of establishing a comprehensive curriculum and degree plan for tennis teachers. Yeah, I think they're at, at nine now at the UST in this country. Um, but it's still, there's not, a curriculum. There's not a, a system. When I was uh, invited to a meeting up here at Lake Nona with Scott Schultz before the facility was built, it were, there were no tennis balls. There's lots of bulldozers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he said, well, we're thinking about putting a committee together um, to develop a certification. And I said, well, we already have a, a curriculum. Yeah. And you know, I just think of Vandermeer and Braden and Van Orn and what we're trying to share with our listeners. Yeah. Here's another thought. Really, the process is to certify first and educate second. Doesn't make sense. You need to really be educated. Uh, is it working? Um, 
And I don't think it's a matter of putting all the pressure on the shoulders of the PTR and the use PTA, but I think everyone would agree that education is key. Here's something that's a buzz now in, in tennis teaching circles, peer to peer coaching. Well, let me just say something quickly too. You know, I was over, <clears throat> went over, uh, I was at the USTA national campus the other day, um, working with a player and then there was a junior tournament going on at the same time. I think it was a level six, so not, not the highest level, but you know, I just walked through and just looking around, you know, and, and like you always say, you know, there's parents with their fingers crossed, just hoping like, come on, but like climbing the fence, but climbing the fence, it was a very difficult thing to do. And I haven't been around junior tennis tournaments that much of late, but just looking around at basic technique, I mean, it, it was hard to watch. You know, I had kind of just had to put my head down because it was hard to watch. I mean, it, it was, uh, no, I just look around and you just see how you just know what kids are being taught. Stop, and, stop and the bleeding. It was brutal. Stop was the bleeding. Brutal. What Welby Van Horn said about tennis teaching, if tennis teachers were doctors, people would be falling dead in the streets. Yeah. And you just think of the money and then you think of the kids, you know, just even injury prevention, but tennis being a lifelong sport and just. Well, yeah. Another yeah, thing is sad. Oh, it's tragedy. With yeah, it's, crim- it's actually criminal. Criminal and a tragedy. Those are With better, better, better words. You can replace money, but you can't replace time. And the thing about time, it's not just, well, um, you know, the kid had, you know, three months of bad lessons. No, he had three months of bad lessons that set him back three years. I mean, it it's so difficult for people to make changes in yeah. their game. I remember wa- I was watching uh, one match a few points and the kid was getting very upset. And I just I kept thinking, you know, it's the engineering problem that's that's causing your emotional problem. But he doesn't know it. You know, when he's missing, he doesn't know why he's missing. Yeah. And it was just like, that was the thought going through my head. It was just, yep, it's the engineering problem. Unfortunately. Oh, he just had a young player come down with his father and we're working with him and he went back to the hotel and the next day he goes, yeah, he's really excited. And he, he was looking at Fetter on, on YouTube clips and I go, he's looking at the raw. Yeah. You know, your kid's 11 years old. Why don't you try to find some film of Roger when he was 11? Yeah. And especially in practice, because that's what most of those YouTube clips, most of them, they're not, it's not like live match play. Yeah. And it's one you know, shot. It's, it's one it's shot. It's practice. And then I always bring this up, you know, Roger telling uh, JJ Wolf and myself, I'm a difficult person to, to copy. <laughs> you know, I mean, all the pros, you know, do you, do you have their motor skills, their, their bodies, their, you know, just anyway. No, we were just, we just started the podcast and before coming in, I was watching uh, Sangren play Djokovic and uh, Austin Krychek's in, in his booth. And uh, I didn't coach uh, Sangren for one second, but I traveled with him for a little bit with uh, Krychek. They're playing doubles. Yeah. And then you, the gentleman you coach from Denmark, played Ohio State. Yeah, Mikhail Torbegard. I know they're great friends. Well, his backhand yeah. doesn't look so good against Djokovic's. He just doesn't get the racket below the ball. Djokovic is lifting more. It's very basic. Yeah. yeah. One just doesn't have the the angle up, and one's going to make the unforced error before the other one. Yeah. Um, but come back into the peer-to-peer coaching is mm-hmm. the new buzz. Yeah. And I think because of the t- pandemic, it's it's really grown. And I, I do think being mentored is is very important, but via telephone call, it's just quite not the same. Zoom call. Um, you know, you get two idiots talking to each other, it's going to produce what? A little, a lot of idiotic thought. Mm. So there's good intentions. There's definitely value, but does it really work? Sure. It helps, but what's better on court or go to work? Um, I should say, you know, be on court and go to work. Then yeah, if that makes sense. You know, it is okay. I'm on the telephone wire. No, I need to get on the court and watch hands on coaches work. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, you know, not a Zoom call. I mean, okay, it's not like it's harmful, but is it really as helpful as it could be? The it's human, helpful, yeah, yeah. But it's kind of like talking theory versus, hey, let's get yeah. practical and get get doing it. No, that's when we trained pros. There was a lecture, <laughs> then a lab, lecture in a lab. Yeah. Um, the USTA, United States Tennis Association, now they certify, they accredit the PTR and USPTA. They didn't do that for the longest time. Of course, the USTA has some deeper pockets. Um, exactly. The 
there's been years of, you know, there, maybe it's just a rumor mill, but the two organizations merging, mm. you know, people talk about the USTA, um, you know, being in charge of both. And if there was just one and then, you know, the, the USTA, I don't think it's fair on uh, how much criticism the USTA gets. I think that we have to criticize us, ourselves first. Mm. Uh, the alpha, the alphabet soup of tennis, there's all these different governing bodies, but if, you know, and again, I do think that an organization could wave their own flag, but they, um, you know, like say, for example, the 17 different sections, they could wave their own flag. This is what we're doing, but yet they yeah. still work with uh, the, the federal agency. They leave, they still work with national headquarters. So it's, you know, all for the good of the game. Yeah. Paul Roeder, who's uh, got a PhD in biomechanics. Uh, his father was the captain of the Dutch uh, Davis Cup team. Mm. He's back with the USTA for a third stint. And my understanding is that um, now under the leadership of Michael Dows with Craig Morris, they're going to, they're working on coming up with a new certification to help American tennis. Uh, the program, Net Generation, from my observation, reports I've heard, uh, I, I don't really see a great base influence. And it should have a great base influence because Craig Morris, um, I always get it mixed up, net generation or next generation. The little kid is, it's, yeah, it's net. Net generation. Net generation. Yeah. But Craig Morris worked for Craig Tiley with Tennis Australia. He was with us for seven years. Um, but it'd be interesting to see what, what happens with uh, I think Craig, the new certification. I think Craig Tiley probably kept Craig Morris maybe in the dark a little bit. Well, you got to go from the boardroom to the, uh, to the locker room. Yeah. Um, with, uh, you know, they're so busy and different, you know, working the tournament, this and that. It's like, and, if, and we're talking about little kid tennis, how, how much focus was on that. Yeah. Um, if it's not keeping it in the dark, it's like, well, that got put on the back burner. Yeah. Um, but it's like you said, you know, before, it, whether you're working with a, six-year-old beginner or somebody ranking the top hundred in the world, you know, there are some basic components because it's physics as far as a forehand being a forehand, you know, things that need to happen. Um, obviously there's going to be stage development when it comes to those two different dynamics, but there are some basics that are governing. Dan Santorum, the CEO of the PTR, I, I first heard this expression. There's a brain drain. There's, a lot of pros retiring, passing away, and there's not that many new pros coming in. And what's mm -hmm. the what's the leadership? Mm -hmm. And then also the demographics of tennis. Uh, Javier Palinko with how many young people are playing the game? Yeah, the Lincoln. most the, the most important. You know, the growth of the game is getting new young players in the game. Yeah, you know that's another thing with pickleball. Um, yeah, I think we should have been ahead of pickleball and said okay. Let's get adults playing with green dot balls and the 10 and under lines yeah. and let's make tennis happen. Um, but we were a step slow on that in tennis yeah. with uh, being a master pro. The PTR was the first organization where you could be a master pro. Then the USPTA followed. Um, now it's an application. You know, there's actually even a course and you pay a fee. Yeah. I remember all, uh, in all the, the checkpoints you got to meet requirements remember in the 1990s paul mcdonald i was living in boca and the boca hotel was hosting the uspta national convention and he brought back brought by a longtime friend jay hardman to my place first time i met jay and I, i've communicated with him on a regular basis all these years later great guy great pro in fact i remember presenting one time at ferris state with him mm -hmm. um i remember saying before i knew he was a master pro he asked me about it. Are you a master pro? I said, I would never apply to be a master pro. I think it should be an honor based on accomplishments. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a little laughter because he, he had just become a master pro. Mm -hmm. um, Dennis Vandermeer, the PTR and the USPTA were rivals. Mm -hmm. And I remember Dennis um, offering me the status yeah. of being a master pro. I would have been like the third or fourth person <laughs> to be yeah. a master pro but I would have had to agree not to invite the USPTA to our campus every year. Um, but you have to tell you have to tell our listeners what you said, Dennis, and what's what Dennis said. Yeah, so there's another story, but um, 
it's in my notes, but Dennis, um, what a salesman. He was telling the students that they should be PTR members only. It's a rainy day and we're in the yeah. classroom and not on the court as much and going back and forth, back and forth. And I generally would just sit in the back and take this all in. And then I finally said, Dennis, I just have one question. <laughs> Could you tell the students why you're a member of the USPTA? And Dennis just says, so many issues. He, uh, he, he, said, just, he just smiled and, and uh, we went forward, but... But he had good politics, good yeah, politics. Yeah, exactly. Um, with, but Dennis, um, to justify the competition, at one point the USPTA, when they when Ferris State started, it was USPTA only. And there was just no way the PTR was going to be on campus. It was like, you're a Democrat, like it is today, unfortunately. There's no middle ground, no yeah. center. You're a Democrat, you're a Republican, right. left and right. <laughs> argue over everything. Yeah. Can't get along on one simple issue. Um, <laughs> Dennis Vandermeer. Uh, yeah. The rainy day. That's right. That's, that was next year ahead of me. That's good. Yeah. Sorry. It just seemed like a good place to yeah, go through that, that story. That's a great story. That's it's, one of my favorite um, stories. Steve, you, that's OB. Um, with Dennis, um, you know, he certainly wanted his organization to be the biggest and the best. Um, at the time with Dennis's genius and I know the, the, um, the USPT had people like Bill Tim, George Basho, but Dennis was working at full time. I mean, he had his tennis university. Mm. Um, he finally based himself after a lot of years on the road in Hilton Head, South Carolina. But so he had Jim Verdick, Jim Blair, he had Bill McKenzie, Gray Brazua. I, I really think back in the 80s, besides having a set plan, say, okay, this is how you teach. Show the young tennis teachers one way to run a group lesson for every basic shot. Yeah. But they were just overall better educators. Um, but that doesn't mean that, um, you know, we just didn't happen to click with the right right person, but that's where it was at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, one thing, Dennis, I didn't follow his advice. I remember Dennis telling me, that you need to be politically connected. So all these years later, you know, one time I was asked to be on the PTR board and I rejected the offer. Um, you know, I think it's, it's much different now. I think it's a matter of submitting names and, and there's a vote, but I was also offered to be on the, to be a board member of the USPTA. Mm -hmm. But this is decades gone by and I just thought it'd be a conflict of interest because my job in the eighties, as I said earlier, is to get other people's jobs. Yeah. Um, reasons to not be proactive, um, you know, not attending the annual conference. You know, I think people have their own schedules. I mean, they have children. Um, but that would be an example of try to get to the annual conferences, try to serve on committees. Yeah. Um, I have been to so many conferences, but I've never served on one committee, USTA, PTR, USPTA. You know, for me, getting really deeply involved in junior tournaments you find yourself going to junior tournaments and not to a USTA or PTR function. Right. I did do this and, um, you know, that's certainly something that's not going on with a pandemic. You and I should be doing this, uh, for clubs, you know, organizations being to, to run, uh, workshops online. Right. Um, you know, there's only so many, so many weeks in the year, so many days in the month, so many hours in the day. Um, Prior to the pandemic, I, I flew to uh, Florida and I met with the CEO of the USPTA to discuss having a, a Vic Braden course. Mm -hmm. um, I also met with the USTA. With the USTA, it was going to be, well, I needed to um, rent courts and then pay a percentage. I said, well, what we, what we would do, the proceeds is just don donate those to Vic's widow. Um, but, you know, I had good intentions uh, meeting with uh, John Embry. Um he did suggest that we just submit a proposal, but I think with having you here full time now, um, that's something that we should just do in house. Yeah. It wouldn't be very difficult for me just to go up to the library and pull out the 200 questions that were on yeah. Vic's test. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's what tennis teachers still need to know. Yeah. Um, during the pandemic, um, uh, Carl Hale, who I know, he was a president. Maybe he still is. I think his term's up with the PTR. 
Um, I told him that I would operate behind the scenes, be incognito and help him with his legacy as president. Um, that time, um, I know that you spent a lot of time uh, promoting pickleball, but I thought something that he could have done with his legacy was, okay, let's save, let's, cr- let's create a campaign to save serve and volley doubles mm. um, or run a campaign for, for peer teaching um, with, but I, I would, even though I've been a member and a tester, you know, I consider myself to be an, an, an outsider because again, I would recommend, especially pros coming up to be proactive, to be involved. Yeah. In closing, uh, some thoughts, uh, I guess this is a long close. <laughs> uh, for Americans, I would recommend to be a member. I know both organizations are international. For the longest time, but PTR more so, right? I mean, when I was living in Germany, I'm not a member of the PTR, but I was thinking about joining um, when I was in Germany, but I think I would have had to go to Italy, which isn't so far away. But but uh, I think I, I think the PTR just seems to me like they're a little more international than the USPTA. Yeah, uh, but the, the USPTA um, had big connections with Japan. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I would agree that the, PTRs international. When you hear about the the rumors of the two organizations eight organizations merging, mm-hmm. it would it would always be Dan Santorum is going to be in charge of the uh, international side, gotcha, yeah. and then uh, John Embry would be in charge of the national side. Mm-hmm. I, I would like to see it be one organization. Some people say no, don't let the USDA touch it. Um, with, I think that's it. Just depends who's. Who's in charge? Who's making the decisions? Yeah. But the USTA being um, more involved financially, it all comes back to tennis education. There's monies that are there. How are the monies being spent? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think Lake Nona, we're, we're neighbors to Lake Nona. If I had a vote, I wouldn't have voted on building 100 tennis courts in one zip code, but they're there. But nevertheless, um, you know, in the player development program gets beat up the most. I think it's $23 million now. Yeah. Is, um, are we really spending all that money on the top players? We need to grow the base. Yeah. Um, well, and train coaches as well. Yeah. So yeah, more money, more money spent, but it's, I think what you need to do is educate the consumer. We have that article that we share with people. It's been of all the articles we put out, it's been, um, yeah. translated in the most languages. Yeah. The parent, for example, in junior tennis, they don't have consumer knowledge. And a lot of times the pro doesn't have product knowledge. Yeah. So then it becomes a street hustle. Yeah. You can go to greatbasetennis.com and find that article under our blog. But again, pro, I salute proactive members of the PTR and use PTA. I understand there's many lanes. I touched upon that earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're in one lane, the lane of teaching and coaching. The tennis directors have to wear many hats. Uh, but our, um, is that one lane of tennis instruction and tennis coaching, is it really getting better? And that's, that's the, that's the, that's the lane that people start in. Yeah. Um, the three organizations, the USDA, PTR and USPTA, uh, they certainly need to come together, but the ITA, the Intercollegiate Tennis Association, um, uh, I think the ITA, just like say Texas tennis or Intermountain tennis, they should, they should wave their own flag. Mm-hmm. College coaches own and operate their own camps. We have to look at any and every which way to improve tennis. Mm. I don't think most college coaches are connected with the PTR or use PTA. I say most. With, as um, camp directors, again, they run camps. Camps yeah. mean little kids. Yeah. College coaches um, are re- recruiting college players but their camp is purely development. Yeah. I think that's a great way to train the next generation of tennis teachers. Uh, typically tennis camps are just an experience. It's the blind leading the blind. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just like with the clubs, we talked about that where early childhood development, they're um, generally it's the, the teacher is someone who has a very gregarious outgoing personality and they yeah. played high school tennis. High school kid. And they're really, the little kids are the ones that need the great start. Mm-hmm. So the priority for college coaches is, is their tennis team winning. Um, some time ago, I made a presentation at the ITA and I said, your camp 
and your team should be one and the same. And we had all sorts of film with Craig Tiley yeah. at Illinois, and we showed that film. And he's someone who was trained to run his camp and run his team pretty much the same way. Yeah. Um, can you imagine if every coach worked as if one of their players had to come from the surrounding community? Mm -hmm. I know it'd be difficult to have that as a rule, but, um, you know, so, you know, you think, think of someone who's coaching, uh, you know, every year they need to have someone who was, you know, not just they moved the area, but they were born and raised in, yeah. in, in, the, in a couple of surrounding zip codes. That'd be great. Uh, here's a story. Dave Fish, Harvard, he used our curriculum for 12 years. Yep. The, uh, at that time, another Harvard graduate, David Benjamin, he coached Princeton forever. Uh, but he also became the director of the ITA. Uh, so one year I was at the NCAs, and at this year's NCAs, I spent some time uh, talking to Billy Pate. And Billy Pate, uh, you know, he's already always been proactive and and served the you know, on the college committees and the college board of directors. And mm -hmm. I remember him telling me that we needed to take the concept to the board. And we never did that, but Dave Fish and Dave Benjamin wanted to try to have our curriculum be looked upon or used by tennis, tennis coaches mm -hmm. um, with, but that's just, just one area But I don't think that college coaches would, they get up in the morning and go on, I run a camp. Yeah. It's kind of, I think of an afterthought. Um, I think some of them, you know, Charlie Havilar, who was with Adidas and now it's Nike. Um, they looked at our um, tennis intelligence implied 25 hour course many mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what sells at a tennis camp is overnight experience, getting the t-shirt, yeah. maybe going away to school um, where mom and dad went to college. Yeah. Um, and it's not a matter of we're going to teach you how to hit a ball. Yeah. We're going to let you go with your palm up serve, your patty cake serve, and we're going to be playing doubles and we're going to have yeah. team tennis and it's going to be fun, fun, fun. Right. So again, te most tennis camps are an experience, not an education, but you could have it become an education. Yeah. Imagine Same that, tennis education on a college campus. <laughs> Same thing with early child development classes. Touched upon that. I mean, was it Pee Wee Tennis, Little Tennis, Quick Start Tennis, uh, Net Generation? Have these programs improved over the years? Are we take, are we teaching the parents to practice with their kids at home? I mean, can you, um, a little kid is hitting a ball off a baseball tee. I mean, kids, people become indignant when you tell them, okay, here's a tennis tee. <laughs> we're going to go slow and we're going to yeah. show you the letter C, high, low, high over the bridge, up the hill, Ferris wheel, make the ball rotate like a bicycle tire. Maybe we should just start going, look, what we're going to start out doing is we're doing the next gen forehand off the cone here. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe we can just repackage it that way. How do, well, lag is, today, today we're going next gen. We know so, you're, we know you're only six, but we're going to put it on the T and we got to teach you the lag and snap. Yeah. We're going to go next gen. On and it's a doorknob right when you get to the contact point. Just turn yeah. your wrist like you're turning the doorknob. We know the target's straight ahead, but we want you to pull that racket to the left as fast as you can. Um, do the certifications create common denominators where I think if you go from uh, one sport to the next, if a kid goes to a softball camp, are they, are they going to be taught a completely different stance? Are they going to be caught, taught completely different grips? You know, there's one thing that's really interesting about a hockey player is their bottom hand is an Eastern grip and their top hand is a continental grip. Yeah. Now, the two, the, uh, we have this young girl here who's hitting the ball quite well, and, um, Taesia. <clears throat> so um, mother's really into it and asking about, because we have her on the right side of number one. Help yeah. Close the racket face so that you can swing inside out. And there is the underspin backhand. There is the backhand volley. Right. And the mother's going, well, when should she change to continental? That's, you've said that's what the pros use. Well, range of motion and flexibility. And I said, just let it evolve. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. There's very few, very few, um, what would you say, um, advanced techniques. Very few, like say a composite grip on a forehand volley versus a forehand grip or yeah. a, a carry, carry yoka. Yeah. 
uh, not to say, how, how do I usually get that wrong? Carry uh, Andres Barbosa is listening right now. And he's yeah. Going, yes. My number one critic. I like Said. that guy. I like that guy. <laughs> Andres. Uh, do you, um, you know, members from, you know, people go from one club <laughs> to the next club. They go from one facility to the next facility. Actually, just on a tennis, at a, you know, a tennis program, a tennis um, battery of courts, you know, there's, this, this club has eight courts, this park has eight courts. There's a program, usually it changes from one court to the next. It's, there's not continuity to your left and to your right. No, exactly. I remember you know, all the years in the tennis college, that was one of the most positive things people would say. Their feedback was it was so nice to go from court to court. And although the personality of the pro would change, but the information was the same, you know, so they would continue to develop. So Andy and I, we hope to live forever, but if not, we're going to reach out from our grave and improve tennis teaching. A few things about the Great Base, and this is not really a commercial, but I'd say majority, a lion's share of the PTR and USPTA membership have not heard of the Great Base. But with your help, Andy, and with your oh, wife, maybe, maybe. I, think, I think more and more are, are aware of what we're doing. But I'd say that most... If My they, hair's going gray in the process. Very gray. Fighting tennis. <laughs> My sanity is uh, at times questionable. Fighting tennis ignorance. <sighs> Could you ask the same question again? We're talking about eight-year-old tennis, and we're, now we're talking about Nadal. Um, but I'd say that even though people have they have, if they've heard of the Great Base, they don't know the history or the educational merit behind it. Um, well, and there's those that just try to copy it, which is fine. Um, highest form of flattery. Yeah. There's a lot of that out there, but it's just kind of like, why don't you just tell them to go to great base tennis? No, we have a lot of ghost followers. <laughs> I have a lot of people that I've trained to teach tennis, but they don't tell anybody that I trained to teach tennis. Yeah. Um, you know, I have like, say Vic, I mean, you know, we don't go a day here. Maybe not. We don't go an hour without on the tennis court mentioning Braden or thinking about Braden. Yeah. But, um, no, I had, there's people I've trained that they tell people they were trained by Braden and they never met him with, or if they met him, maybe it was an elevator ride. Um, with um, the CEOs of both organizations, if they would check on our work, Dan Santorum was handpicked by Dennis Vandermeer. He's been, he was with Dennis Vandermeer for decades. Dan, Dan's a sharp guy. He would see Dennis Vandermeer's fingerprints over what we do. And just all you'd have to do is watch what we do for yeah. a short period of time. Yeah. Now, John Embry, uh, Paul McDonald was telling me that he has a pretty impressive background as a tennis player. Um, yeah, I've been on the court with him, little dubs. I think he, I think Paul said he played at William Mary, but um, you know he wouldn't have the same experience as Dan having spent all those years with Vandermeer. But um, I think Embry could easily see the pathway of occupational competency for his incoming members. Mm -hmm. um, so in closing, I've said that once already, but the certif certification is not education, but it can be. Yeah. It can be. Um, I look as one as informal education, certification. And I think of formal education, getting the sheepskin, going to college, yeah. four year program, master's degree. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, another one, another way to say that is certification is short term courses or coursework. Mm -hmm. And education is long-term coursework. Um, certification or organizational approach is needed. Granted, all the add-on uh, certifications, um, and they're just that, they're add-ons. They're important. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not in that circle anymore where, okay, you're training coaches at a large commercial club and there's a large gym and you talk to the fitness instructors. Yeah. And How do you that, manage that? Well, that's the same thing though. They have all sorts of certificates. Yeah. There's yeah, just, exactly. there's a, there's a new one all the time. Like, yeah. how, how can we make money? Um, but the, the, <laughs> the two main cert certifications, USPTA, PTR, they should really be difference makers. Um, they, I think the USTA, um, you know, as far as lending a, a helping hand, but it'll be interesting in the years to come what happens with the three organizations. Mm -hmm. And I do understand that now they're, um, the ITA is, they want to also be heavily involved in a new program, a new way to uh, certify tennis educators. But I think really there needs to be a school. You know, people say that we're old school. 
old school, new school, there is no school. Yeah, I always tell people the key word there is school. But and, I think, uh, you know, and again, if we come across negative at all, it's, it's not, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a member of the USPTA, PTR, a lifetime member of the USTA. If, um, with, um, I don't think it's a matter of, uh, you know, don't throw stones if you live in a glass house, but everybody needs to do their part to help the growth and welfare of tennis all over the world. But in this country, I'll just say this last thing is tennis needs a shot in the arm. Yeah. We've all got a few shots in our arm with the uh, pandemic. I think maybe it needs like a 45 caliber shot <laughs> in the arm. You know, not, not like a little 22 or a BB. Yeah, I like Jim Lehrer's you know. line where for someone to change, you need to put a stick of dynamite underneath their seat. Yeah. <laughs> Just think of the reaction. It's like a cartoon. Okay, I'm into it now. <laughs> but no, we did uh, mention that we would talk about the, um, the USPTA PTR certifications. Um, and uh, I hope we've shared some points of interest with our listeners. Yeah, thanks everybody for listening. And uh, you can reach out to us with any comments, questions, info at greatbasetennis.com. Find us online at Great Base Tennis, social media, all that good stuff. Yeah, and this last, this is 42, so 10 more weeks to go for our first year podcast. And we still have to cover uh, two more pillars, Dennis Vandermeer and Vic Braden. Yeah. Also, if you're enjoying our podcast, go to Apple, give us a rating, leave us a comment. That would be appreciated. Can they rate help you us, and then help, rate me? We get, yeah, all, is is it all one? Or? They can do that. It's all one, but you, you could write whatever you want. Oh, that's right. I said that's right. Yeah, we get a lot of fives. So I'm, I'm a 10 <laughs> years old. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, all right, all right team. Thanks for listening. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks. Adios.